Okay. Um, welcome to the second meeting of the Abandoned and Derelict Vessel Work Group. Um, thank you all again for your participation last month in our first meeting. Uh, I'm just going to give a quick overview of the agenda, and then I'm going to do uh, sort of the um, introductions. Um, well, today we will be going over uh, sort of roles, authorities, and jurisdiction, um, kind of from a state and federal level. Uh, and we're going to share some of the gaps and challenges that uh, we've identified already. Um, and then we'll switch to a discussion portion of today, uh, which includes um, reviewing some of the recommendations from the ADV Blue Ribbon Program Report uh, on authorities, which we'll share more about that report a little later, and um, as well as some of the uh, recommendations that we heard from folks um, previously in interviews that we held earlier this summer. Um, as a reminder, we have a handy web page where we keep all of the meeting materials, uh, agendas, summaries, um, recordings, and as well as the uh, presentation um, from these meetings, slides from these meetings. And, um, and I will switch to introductions in a moment, but just a reminder that the anticipated schedule of meetings for this effort uh, is approximately uh, twice a month on Tuesdays. Um, and our next meeting will be October 24th. Um, December 5th, we have tentatively identified as a good date to have a hybrid meeting. Um, so please uh, just note that for your calendar, um, we would love to have folks um, meet each other as much as possible. And we'll be sharing more details about that as soon as those are shored up. Um, and we hope to potentially have another hybrid meeting uh, in 2024. But again, um, we'll, we'll be sharing more details about that in the future. Um, for member participation, uh, you know, uh, for the ADV group, group members, uh, just a reminder that when we get to the discussion portion, you can just use that raise hand feature to speak. Um, there's uh, reactions near the bottom of the screen. There's a raise hand button. Um, but if you're on the phone, you can press uh, uh, star nine and uh, our facilitator will call on you in the order in which you, know, you raised your hand. Uh, but otherwise, um, if you would please just keep your mic muted until it's your turn to speak. Um, and when it is, you just state your name and, uh, you know, off you go. <laughs> Um, and a reminder that as part of uh, every work group meeting, we do reserve uh, 10 minutes um, at the end of every work group meeting for community input. Uh, our, our work group meetings are open to community members to attend, stay connected, um, and to also uh, voice uh, their input directly to the work group members and just stay more um, connected to the conversation. Um, and we will be having a reminder again, we will be having a, a comment period to reach a broader uh, group in early 2024. Um, before I get on to introductions, um, I wanted to share a fun update uh, about active removals that are happening right now. Um, the Tiffany was successfully and uneventfully removed from the waterway yesterday. Uh, deconstruction has already started, um, and we're expecting it to take uh, approximately, uh, well, less than four weeks. Um, it's a 200 ton ADV, high levels of PCBs on board. And uh, for those who aren't familiar with it, it's being pulled out of the Columbia, well, has been pulled out of the Columbia River uh, and, and uh, is currently in Astoria at the Hayek Maritime. And we got a fun photo too from yesterday uh, of our ADV work group member, Aaron Harrington, uh, who is the director of casualty response um, at Global Diving, as well as his associate, Willie Hayward. Um, so this is them yesterday uh, at the removal. Um, this is actually a great segue to the introductions because um, I missed Aaron. 
in last month's introduction. So I'm hoping that Aaron can introduce himself today if he's online. I can. Thanks. Oh, perfect. Yeah. No worries. Hey, uh, yeah, I appreciate it. I was, I was driving for the last meeting, so it was not opportune. But uh, yeah, so just a quick uh, bio on me. I've been working at Global for 25 years, uh, done a variety of projects around here. Uh, you know, we were involved with the River Queen, the work at Goble, uh, the Tourist 2 up there in Astoria. So uh, anyways, yeah, we just happy to be a part of the conversation here and uh, use this as a resource uh, for whatever you guys are looking for down the road here. And we've been doing it for the state of Washington for as long as the, the program has been around and uh, know the DNR team very well and the DOE. So uh, Happy to help out wherever we can. Awesome, thank you. <clears throat> um, we also have a few new faces today that I wanna make sure we introduce as well. Um, we have new members uh, joining us um, from the US Coast Guard, and I know a few of them are online today. Um, I guess I will see if I can call on them in order. Um, I believe we have Lieutenant Gilligan, Could you introduce yourself? Or I can skip to the next person if you're not quite ready. Oh, Lieutenant does not have mic access. Okay. <laughs> well, uh, Lieutenant Gilligan is joining us um, as well as, um, I know we have one more. Let's see if they're online. It's hard, there's a lot of faces here. Oh, thank you. Uh, Lieutenant Gilligan is the Waterways Management Facility uh, Division Chief at Sector Columbia River. Um, and then I think we also have Joe Anthony. Could you introduce yourself? Yeah, thanks, Kate. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, unsure if my camera is working. It says the light is on, but mm -hmm. uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, Lieutenant Commander Joe Anthony, I'm the Chief of Incident Management Division for Sector Columbia River. Back here on my on my shoulder here is my uh, IMD Astoria Shop Supervisor, Lieutenant Dan Russo. So thanks for having us. Happy to be here. Awesome. I think, am I missing anyone from the U.S. Coast Guard? I think okay. that's it. Okay, thank you. And then we also have Doug. Doug is uh, is a delegate for um, Stan Tonneson, who uh, you all met last month um, representing Wu. And Doug's uh, joining us here today, um, and I think for a couple a couple next meetings, um, and mm -hmm. tag teaming it with Stan. Can you introduce yes. yourself? Yeah, my name is Doug Bromju. I'm the executive vice president of the Columbia River Yachting Association, and basically that's a group of boaters that are all the local yacht clubs. So we represent about 2000 active boaters in the area. Um, and our goal is to, you know, hopefully bring forward that we can volunteer our time too, to help, you know, identify where some of these vessels are at. And, and so that's been our part. And I've worked with Stan on a lot of things over the last few years. So we're, we're pretty in touch with each other. So thanks for having me here. Yeah, awesome, thank you. And then last but not least, we have our facilitators. Uh, I want to introduce uh, Eric Chenson and Jack Heffernan. Um, uh, yeah, if you could introduce yourself. Sure, uh, I'm Eric Jensen, and um, our firm Jensen Strategies was retained to uh, facilitate this group. And we're really looking forward to getting into uh, uh, into the issues here. Uh, this is this is a new issue for us uh, in terms of facilitating. And uh, so we're happy to do that. We are a management consulting firm. Uh, we're based in Portland. And um, we do a lot of collaborative uh, decision making, uh, as well as organizational development and executive recruitments. Um, but uh, I'm looking forward to working with the group. I've had a, a very uh, short period of time to kind of ramp up. And so uh, maybe a little learning curve for me today, but uh, uh, happy to be on board. Uh, with me is Jack Heffernan. Uh, Jack is a project associate with our firm, uh, has just uh, come on board. And uh, 
And, and Jack, I don't know if you'd like to say a little bit about yourself. Yes, hi. As uh, Eric mentioned, I'm a project associate with Jensen Strategies, and I'm here today to, um, uh, like Eric mentioned, get up to speed, and also I'll be taking some notes on um, on the meeting. So uh, nice to meet all of you. Thank you. Um, wonderful. So I think that covers um, introductions of new faces. So um, let me figure out how to share my screen again. One second. Um, really should get my second monitor set up. That'd probably, <laughs> uh, okay, here we go. Um, now we are going to switch gears to the next part of uh, today's discussion, which is um, each of uh, the partner agencies online today. Uh, so Department of State Lands, um, Oregon State Marine Board, uh, Department of Environmental Quality, and um, the Oregon Parks and Recreation Department will each share a little bit about um, the roles, authorities, and jurisdiction um, that uh, each has within the context of ADVs and AD, whether it's ADV response or prevention. Um, so with that, I'm going to kick it over to uh, Chris Castelli. Um, yeah. Good afternoon, everyone. It's nice to see you all again. And thanks for joining us today. Uh, it's been a busy day here at the department. We had a land board meeting this morning. Uh, so the governor, secretary of state, um, secretary of state was online and the treasurer were here. Uh, we did talk a little bit about ADVs and just let you know, uh, they, so we gave an update on this group, but also uh, they did have a few questions about if we've talked about insurance yet, especially treasurer Reed. So um, I told him, or Vicky told him, our director, not yet, but it is on our list of topics. Uh, with that, let's talk a little bit about DSL's role as a um, land manager for the people of Oregon as it pertains to um, state-owned waterways. So uh, upon coming into the union, Oregon was granted ownership of all the submerged and submersible lands underlying navigable and tightly influenced waterways. Um, so all of the bays, uh, anything that's tightly influenced, most of the coastal rivers are uh, state-owned or currently state-owned to head of tide. We have, uh, we've done over the years different surveys of the head of tide on state-owned waterways. Uh, all rivers that have been um, determined to be navigable or declared navigable, there's a process in state statute with regards to the land board determining a river to be navigable. The list is not all encompassing right now because there's a lot of work to that, but all your major waterways ways, uh, Willamette River, Columbia River, Rogue, um, while well, the Rogue still has some work to be done on that, uh, etc. Um, Sandy River, Snake River, uh, etc. And then all meandered lakes, and a meandered lake is um, essentially a lake who natural lake whose boundary was surveyed when the U.S. cadastral engineers were going around surveying the West, the predecessor to the um, Geological Survey, and they stopped and meandered the boundaries of most lakes that were over 25 acres in size. So Devil's Lake, Ten Mile Lakes, Wohink Lake, Cullaby Lake for our folks up in the Clatsop County area, etc. Those are all meandered lakes and the, their bed and banks are state owned. Uh, next slide. Uh, so through our land management division um, and the aquatic resource management part of the, the agency, we uh, manage the day-to-day -day uses on those state-owned waterways. First of all, our first and foremost uh, goal is to protect the uh, collectively the public's rights to use those waterways for fishing, navigation, commerce, and recreation, also known as the public trust doctrine and the public trust values. Uh, we are um, authorized by the legislature and the land board to authorize, uh, allow uses of those, those lands as well, as long as they, and the, the bar is that, as long as they don't unreasonably interfere with those public trust values. Uh, the department does uh, do a, quite a bit of leasing with ports, marinas, et cetera, for, for uses of state-owned waterways. Uh, personal docks are registered with the department. Cables that cross waterways have easements with the department. Boat ramps have public facility licenses, et cetera. Um, 
And any re re revenue, some of those are free. Some of those have, have rents and compensation. Uh, the revenues that are generated from uses of state-owned waterways are uh, deposited into the Common School Fund uh, for use uh, for use for uh, Oregon's K through 12 public schools. Uh, we did in 2015 have a bill passed to establish uh, the Submerged Lands Enhancement Fund so we could uh, take some of that money, that revenue that's generated from state-owned lands and put it back into the waterway in, in the form of enhancement projects. It was, uh, we like to borrow from our neighbors to the north. It was sort of established to mirror the Aquatic Lands Enhancement Fund that Washington DNR already had. Um, and yeah, we are able to invest 20% of the revenues we generate uh, in, in um, to put, put back into the waterway. Uh, the legislature currently has our limitation in the budget at $200,000, but 20% uh, of what we generate is, 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 more, is more than that. We generate a few million dollars, I think, a year off the waterway program. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, however, as so I said, most uses are um, do require a written authorization from the department. There, uh, a couple of things are exempt, and one of them would be limited duration uses. And that is meant for both commercial and non-commercial boats, typically using state-owned waterways, which in itself is sort of a public trust use. Um, and we have two different criteria for being limited duration and being just allowed to be occupying state-owned lands. Um, for commercial uses, it's, it's not more than 14 consecutive days in any one location. And for non-commercial, so somebody who is, let's say, camping on a sailboat, um, that would be no more than 30 calendar days during any 12-month period of time within a five-mile uh, area of river, let's say river or waterway. They are a little different, uh, and that was to acknowledge that... Um, Commercial uses, let's say barges that have to stop below um, or above a, a lock and dam or boats that are waiting for tides to leave uh, the Columbia River or other waterways, sort of, they sort of, they come to the same spot over and over again, or they'll be at the same spot. So they didn't, they have a little different, they want to make sure that they're not just using this area as a moorage, but um, so they have to leave. They can only stay there for 14 consecutive days. But I, I wanted to acknowledge that in a lot of cases, these commercial vessels kind of end up at the same spot. So they don't get stuck with that 30 calendar days within a 12 month period. So we're trying to I remember when this was written into rule, it was meant to accommodate um, those sort of steamship operators as well as address um, vessels that wanted to camp legally on on um, state on waterways in the summertime, but not to, to encourage them to live uh, live there. They're therefore limited duration use. Uh, and as it also says on this slide, DSL has the authority and the responsibility to pursue trespasses uh, if somebody is uh, occupying state on submerged submersible lands with. Uh, inappropriately or without authorization. And we do have civil penalty authority through um, ORS 274 and we administer it through those rules, Division 82. Uh, next slide. Uh, la lastly, there's a few key definitions here with regards to abandoned and derelict vessels um, and then abandoned structures. They're a little different. Uh, we do have these definitions in our administrative rules, but the, the definitions from abandoned vessel and derelict vessel do come from the Marine Board's statutes. We use the Marine Board statutes when we address abandoned and derelict vessels, uh, the notification process, the seizure process, the pre-seizure process, et cetera. Uh, and then after that program was established, we also had some statutory language added to our statutes to address structures, a structure. Uh, and we'll talk about this a little later. It gets a little, little murky. What's a structure? What's a vessel? Let's say a dock. Somebody's abandoned dock or a piling field or things like that. Those are structures. And um, our statutes about the same time as the Submerged Lands Enhancement Fund was established, were uh, bolstered a little bit to address abandoned structures with definitions. And then we followed up later with um, uh, for flushing out the process in our administrative rules. Next slide. 
Uh, and then lastly, what, one other piece of um, sort of jurisdiction the department has is with regards to uh, ship breaking. And I'm not the expert on this. wish Patricia Fox was here to talk about this. But there is a ship breaking statute with regards to uh, removing vessels, large vessels, or addressing those um, that need to be decommissioned in place or at least uh, and or, or not in a, in a position, whether size or integrity, to be moved to a uh, facility first before being dismantled or have to be dismantled or broken up in some some respect on the waterway. And that is um, that there's a shipbreaking statute with regards to that. And the department has some of the department of state lands has some authorities under that ORS 783-400. Uh, and next slide. Uh, lastly, so this is um, just a piece of policy with regards to um, the department's management of state-owned waterways. Uh, it's an example that of uh, the department being a little proactive um, to try to address vessels and make sure vessels are being accounted for in um, commercial marinas, is that in our, our new leases, we do require marina operators to provide an annual list of vessels that are um, occupying or renting slips within their marinas and provide that information to the Marine Board so we can keep uh, up to date uh, on um, those vessels, their registration numbers, the expiration dates, and follow up with those individual owners. And that's, you know, basically trying to, to prevent ADVs by, by keeping tabs of vessels sort of ahead of time. This didn't require any statutory change for, for the uh, for the department and didn't require any rule changes either. Uh, we are incorporating this into leases as we issue new leases and as they come up for renewal, uh, folks that already have an existing lease, uh, you know, they we are bound to uh, follow the, the current condition, terms and conditions of those leases, but we are adding this condition and reporting requirement as, as leases come up for renewal um, for marinas. And next slide. And I think I get to hand it over to our good friends at the Marine Board here. So thank you for your time. Yeah, thanks, Chris. I am Dorothy Deal. I'm with the Oregon State Marine Board, um, where we serve Oregon's recreational boaters through access, education, enforcement, and environmental stewardship. So when you hear the words Marine Board, um, that can refer to the five members of the governor appointed board who are volunteers who oversee um, the implementation of everything that our agency does, or it can refer to the 40 or so folks like me um, who make up the actual agency located in Salem. Um, our major responsibilities are boat titling and registration, um, which is kind of how most people know us. Um, we also do marine law enforcement training and funding, including providing boats to them so they can be out on the water. Um, boater education in the form of mandatory boating safety education and supplemental education for boaters. And then finally, um, engineering and funding of boating access facilities. So picture your boat ramps, um, tie up docks, restrooms, floating restrooms, pump out stations and, and things like that that serve boaters. Um, next slide, please. So chapter 830 um, in the Oregon Revised Statutes is the chapter that establishes the Marine Board as an agency and then gives the agency the authority to carry out everything is, that is in that chapter and to um, create administrative rules um, in support of serving voters under our authority in that chapter. So it's also the first place that you see those definitions pop up for abandoned and derelict vessels, and also where you see the authorities associated with those described. Um, so those definitions are kind of narrow and a little bit um, confusing for some folks because they don't necessarily align with the way that everybody just generally uses those words, which is typical of a lot of legal language. Um, so sometimes there are some misconceptions about what equates to an abandoned or a derelict vessel, but it's fairly explicit um, in that statute. If a boat um, is someplace where it doesn't have an authorization to be, um, it may meet the definition of abandoned. And so another misconception is that um, there's an entity out there that can or must declare that a boat is abandoned or derelict, um, when in reality, any enforcement agency that has probable cause 
to suspect that a boat meets those definitions can initiate that seizure process. And then the burden is on that enforcement agency to support that assertion if the owner then you know, contests or argues against that assumption. Um, so who are the enforcement agencies? Um, 20 years ago, the only enforcement agency that could seize a boat was the local sheriff's office. And that had a lot of problems and wasn't effective for a lot of reasons. So authority was expanded to ports. Um, and then at the same time, the legislature also gave the Marine Board authority to set aside some of our revenue every two years to reimburse those entities when they had to deal with abandoned boats. And then after a few years, they realized there aren't really a lot of ADV removals happening. So let's expand the authority of who can actually go out and initiate seizures of ADVs. So it's very, very broad. You can see the definitions um, at the bottom of the slide. It's practically any, any public entity or even kind of quasi public entity that finds themselves in a position of needing to deal with an ADV um, is going to have authority under that statute to initiate the seizure process of an ADV. Um, and so that includes the Marine Board. Um, and so we can either reimburse entities for their activities related to ADVs, or when we want to, and it's prudent, we can initiate our own removals. Um, so that, I'll go to the next slide. And uh, this is an overview of the salvage vessel subaccount, which is that account that was established um, by the legislature where the Marine Board has the authority to set aside some of our revenue. Um, it's called a sub-account because it's inside the Boating Safety Law Enforcement and Facility account. Um, we can set aside no more than $150,000 per biennium. And initially under those statutes, it was set up so that we could just reimburse mostly law enforcement and ports for work that they were doing. Um, and then it was expanded but still, ideally, it would function as a reimbursement account um, because oftentimes a local entity can respond much more quickly and efficiently and even cost effectively um, to deal with a local ADV issue and then simply request reimbursement um, versus, you know, my ability to efficiently and quickly respond to something from my desk in Salem. Um, so kind of an overview of the account and then what our authorities are and then what are the statutes that establish our authority also describe the authority of all of these other entities. And I will pass it off to whoever is next. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Abby Baduris. Um, I will, uh, I'll introduce myself. I was not at the first meeting. Um, my colleague Logan was here. <clears throat> and forgive me, I'm a little under the weather. So doing my best, I will be brief. Um, <clears throat> so DEQ's role in ADVs is really narrow and specific, generally related to threats to the waters of the state. Um, DEQ's mission is to be a leader in restoring, maintaining, and enhancing the qualities of Oregon's air, land, and water. So for abandoned derelict vessels, that primarily means ensuring that any oil or hazardous materials have been removed um, and don't pre present any danger to the public or the environment. Following kind of the removal of oil or hazardous materials, we don't have any authority um, are of our own to remove the vessel, but we do support other agencies um, in inspecting the vessels for these materials, especially those ones that have the potential to sink. Um, and we, you know, those of us have been doing this, sometimes these things do sink uh, while we're uh, removing them. Um, <clears throat> I, I do feel obliged to point out we do not have any dedicated staff or funding to do the work that we do. Um, our work in this realm is typically on cost. We recover the, our costs, um, which is challenging with an abandoned or derelict vessel. Um, we do have an additional role. I guess, please go to the next slide. 
um, in permitting activities related to the deconstruction of vessels once they're removed. Um, you can see kind of a list of there, I won't go on, but we do issue a variety of permits that allow for deconstruction to be done in a safe, clean, compliant manner. Um, we do have subject ex matter experts who will also engage on asbestos abatement, lead abatement, PCB dissection, and then the, the management of the waste stream. Um, and then the last role I'll mention for DEQ is that we have with our partners, some of our partners here created and we may help maintain a database um, of uh, abandoned derelict vessels that we, uh, we are aware of um, to track their movement and coordination on removal. And I believe this will be a topic for a future meeting. So I won't go any further there. So whoever is next probably parks, I'm guessing. Good afternoon, everyone. Again, my name is Justin Parker. I'm a district manager here with State Parks, representing the agency today in the meeting. So we do manage a statewide system of state parks, as the slide says, pretty diverse from the Land River Green Lake to the Ocean Source State Recreation Area, and a wide variety of park types. As it relates to ADVs, um, we don't have you know, salvage authority or scrapping authority or any of that. Our response is basically to use our rangers to go out there and be a lot of times the first on scene uh, folks use their local knowledge to get additional resources out to that area. We rely heavily on, of course, our federal and state partner agencies, and we appreciate their efforts. Uh, freshwater ecosystems such as the Willamette Greenway, campgrounds, lakes and morges, that's uh, probably a minority of the amount of calls we have. Uh, most of our vessels do end up, that we have to deal with, do end up on the ocean shore, so also ocean shore state recreation area, and it's a uh, our jurisdiction by statute and rule is from the extreme low tide to the land of the statutory vegetation line or established shoreline vegetation, whichever is further east. And uh, a lot of times these incidents happen in very remote areas. There's a lot of cultural resources concerns, a lot of uh, ocean shore permitting that those types of permits may have to be issued in addition to salvage permits from other agencies. And often there's no insurance for these vessels. And so it's quite a process for us to untangle uh, these challenges, but we do use our existing authority to do so. And we're never sure when they're going to show up, like a lot of the people on this call, right? Some years we have quite a few, and other years it's not as bad. But when we do, it does take up a lot of agency resources and uh, community resources. Thank you. All right, Kate, is this back to me? Okay, thanks. Uh, there's a brief summary. Uh, I can't, I'm can't. i not an expert. I can't speak to these, but here's a brief summary of some of the federal agencies that also have ADV authorities. Um, we have NOAA there. I think we've actually been able to access. We have a, I know we have an Oregon Marine Debris Action Plan because I remember working on that. Um, and I think we've, as a state, have been able to access that in the past to remove some ADVs. I think you have the Western down in Coos Bay, I think. Um the Army Corps of Engineers, thinking of the role is uh, in navigational servitude. Um, the United States Coast Guard is, is somebody that we partner with a lot with regards to um, addressing ADVs, and they do a lot of, frankly, they'll raise vessels and pump at least uh, the, the hazardous materials off of those when they can. Uh, Environmental Protection Agency and the Federal Emergency Management Agency, um, FEMA. So in general, um, they don't have funding to support actions beyond responding to ADVs, posing navigational hazards uh, in, in federally managed channels and, um, and to manage those for pollution. <clears throat> I do know when we address ADVs in the past, um, the, the U.S. Coast Guard, it, it, you know, uh, we, we try to do our best, as I uh, actually as, I would say, as Abby mentioned, when it comes to trying to recover costs, we, we do try to do our best to, to recover our costs when we when we address an ADV, including um, filing actions against the owner or the last owner of record uh, with uh, with regards to civil recovery. Uh, and, and in a few of those cases, we have actually been sort of partnered up with the U.S. Coast Guard. Uh, and I'm sure they can always they can speak to this, too, but they do have. Um, the, they get the they get the first shot at any money that might be left or monies that might be left um yeah, that that might be available to uh, to recover costs uh, the fed, federal agencies do get um priority with regards to that uh, over the state um so how about the next slide 
So here's a summary of the state authorities, uh, Department of State Lands, the landowner and steward of publicly owned waterways. DEQ regulates hazardous wastes and, um, and houses the Oregon Emergency Response System. Um, Oregon State Marine Board regulates recreational boating and vessels. Uh, and OPRD manages the Oregon coast to the extreme low water line um, up to the vegetation line and then bodies of waters in, in around campgrounds. Uh, we actually do have some um, uh, intergovernmental agreements with OPRD with regards to managing um, submerged submersible lands adjacent to some of their parks. I'm thinking about in the Chetco River and they also do some good work for us on the Sandy River too. Um, so what does collaboration look like? Uh, we worked with Coast Guard, Metro, DEQ, um, to help dispose of the uh, Alert and Sacarissa, which were two large vessels off of Hayden Island on the Columbia River. Uh, I, th I thought the coordination was very good with regards to those vessels, uh, and we did split the costs with regards to um, the removal of those vessels. I don't remember the total amount right now. Um, Kate, was it um, $6 million? So I think it was just a little bit more than that. But yeah, ballpark. I think it, it might have been seven to eight. Um, Thank you. But. And um, and um, so Joe Anthony from the Coast Guard has his hand up. Maybe he'd like to add something. Yeah, hey, this is actually uh, Lieutenant Russo. I'm, I'm in the room as well with Lieutenant Commander Anthony. Um, to piggyback off of what you said, uh, the the in terms of the funding component for the Department of, well, really any any state agency can access funding through the oil spill liability trust fund um, through a couple different avenues, but in short, and Kate and I spoke about this a couple months back. Um, it's, it's codified in the third in, in the CFR is 33 CFR. I think it's 136 talks about state access to the OS bill liability trust fund, as well as the circle of fund. Um, and I know we're not on the, the docket here to talk about authorities and jurisdiction, but as, pretty much everybody's already kind of hinted at and, and we've spoken around in terms of the the Coast Guard's authority and jurisdiction to, to go after um, or to tackle ADVs. It is primarily just as a pollution potential, at least when with respect to access to funding to clean it up. Um, uh, Carly Gilligan, uh, who's in waterways and facilities might have a little bit more, but really if it's not it's, if it's not actively impacting a waterway that's going to negatively impact the maritime transportation system um, or impact uh, uh, navigation, if, if it does either of those things, it's within her wheelhouse of the, the waterway or the facility um, component. But if it is potentially discharging oil um, or hazardous materials, then it's within our wheelhouse of the IMD shop and we can access our funding, but only in the coastal zone. Again, our, our our jurisdiction is a little funky in that um, it, it's kind of agreed upon with the EPA that we have coastal and they have inland and that that line is delineated. Um, usually the first highway that the, that crosses whatever the waterway is, um, is on the west side of that is the United States Coast Guard and on the east side of that is the EPA. Um, there's some other little quirks that we've identified, um, but in short, that's that's roughly our jurisdiction. And then again, as we say to the authorities are, if there's a substantial threat or an actual discharge, we can do cleanup if there's no uh, owner. Um, and if it's all obviously offshore, we can also do that. And I'll leave it at that. Sorry to jump in and kind of steal your thunder there. No, that's great. We appreciate you um, joining me. Yeah, I didn't want to put you on the spot, but you put yourself on the spot, so thanks. <laughs> and yeah, thank you. And Abby also made a correction to this, uh, this slide too. And actually, I'm glad you said something that DEQ does not house the uh, Oregon Emergency Response System, although they do respond. They're one of the major ag agencies that respond. And thank you for that clarification. And I think you even put in there was Office of Emergency Management. I thought it sounded wrong when I read it out loud. So I was like, either I learned something new or this is not quite right. So thank you for correcting us, Abby. Um, and is the next slide me too, Kate, or are we? Yes, oh, last one for you. <laughs> All right. Uh, gaps and challenges with regards to roles, authorities, and jurisdiction. Uh, so I mentioned, as you know, House Bill 2914 places the ADV program at DSL. Um, 
and the fund at Treasury. And, and tr as a, I, as I mentioned really early on, that you know we are the administrative arm of the land board, so that is the governor, the secretary of state, and the state treasurer. Um, and we have a chapter of statute 274 that we manage state-owned submerged submersible lands under. Uh, I mentioned types of waterways that are determined to be navigable. Tidally owned waterways, waterways the land board has declared to be navigable in those meandered lakes. That does not encompass the whole world of um, waterways that people boat on. Uh, reservoirs are not state owned typically, unless the underlying river or like the Columbia uh, was is already navigable. And there's a lot of rivers that people recreate on with vessels that have not had a navigability study. And there's some mention of those waterways there. Detroit Lake would be an example. Neither Santiam River, north or south, the Deschutes River. Uh, there's a major gap on the Umpqua River. The state owns the Umpqua River to um, Scottsburg, I believe, which is uh, way down near the coast to the head of tide. And then the rest of the river doesn't have any navigability determinations to get way up on the North Umpqua River when someone sued us to quiet title and the court circuit court ruled it determined it to be navigable. Uh, unfortunately, they would not allow us to to claim everything is navigable from where that court case was down to Scottsburg. So there's a hundred miles between uh, state ownership there. Um, and then the blurred lines, and this gets difficult for us when we address large flotillas of um, structures and vessels, uh, between vessels and structures. Uh, many sites include both. If you've been to Multnomah Channel, there are some large groups of uh, vessels and structures um, not very far from the Salve Island boat ramp. And we have to we have to treat those differently. Um, also, who can address them is different. For example, uh, you know, as Dorothy talked about, enforcement agencies has been expanded. So other, the sheriff's office or local governments can address or um, abandoned and derelict vessels. Uh, state statute has not given that uh, expanded authority when it comes to addressing an abandoned or derelict float home as a structure or other um, structures. So those are solely the responsibility of the Department of State Lands to address. Uh, and then they can have some, if you're addressing a big flotilla, they can also have the, the processes can be a little different with regards to those under the Marine Board statutes for addressing the vessels and then uh, the department's uh, uh, function in addressing the, the structures. And I get, we'll stop there for now. Thank you. Thank you. Um, on this uh, last slide regarding gaps and challenges, I was gonna invite Josh and Dorothy um, to offer any context um, on some of these challenges uh, they had identified from, from the Marine Board's perspective or, or experiences. Yeah, sure. And and some of these that I'll talk about briefly apply to more narrowly the, the Marine Board and in our dealings in this realm. And some of them are would be applied more broadly uh, across all state agencies. So some things that, that we found in our experiences, um, one, I, this first one I reference uh, boat registration and, and enforcement authorities for that. Um, we've we've seen a pretty strong correlation between registration compliance um, and present and potential future ADVs. Um, but registration enforcement is, is not necessarily a priority for most law enforcement agencies, especially the ones we contract with. They are first and foremost responsible, responsible for keeping those on the waterways safe. And, and many probably correctly argue that they are underfunded to, to even do that adequately. Um, so there just isn't a motivation for them to um, to make registration compliance, especially of, of, of docked boats, um, for instance, a, a true priority for them. And registration compliance suffers, and and then subsequently, you know, you see more boats able to fall into true ADV status. Um, something that's been part of these conversations, whether it's the legislature uh, through through our agency, um, is that people people will say commercial boats don't need to be registered. Um, and therefore don't generate any potential revenue for, for addressing this issue. That's technically true. They're not registered through the Marine Board, um, but something to, to note is that any boat in the water, in Oregon waters needs to be credentialed by someone and have a current credential, whether it's recreationally through the Marine Board, whether it's commercial credentials through the federal government. Um, but right now there is no commercial boat registration, state registration, 
that's mandatory. Um, another, I guess we'll call this a challenge uh, or a gap, or maybe just a misconception, um, is the difference between ADVs and things that other that some might find um, undesirable. Um, I think Dorothy and Chris actually touched on those those pretty narrow definitions of, of, of uh, an abandoned boat and a derelict boat. Um, there are still, but over fifty percent of the calls we get about ADVs are not true ADVs meeting those two definitions. And so that's a kind of a um, messaging challenge that we often face. Um, I'll, I'll add the last two to, or the fourth and fifth one together for the sake of time. And this one's more narrow for the Marine Board is that you know, Dorothy laid out what we do fairly well early. I won't go back into that. Um, but our ADV authority is quite broad, but our involvement is not usually limited by that. It's that often these things are outside of our our charge, our scope. There are certainly times when ADV stuff interferes with our ability to serve the building public and we are equipped and, and do respond in those situations. Um, but oftentimes we get the call, you know, who's, whose responsibility is to move that boat? And the true answer is usually, well, no, it's no one, no state agencies. The person responsible for moving that boat is the person responsible for it being there in the first place. And that's uh, that's another messaging challenge that we've had to overcome. Uh, and that brings me to the last one on here is that uh, we see that the accountable parties in many of these situations are quickly dismissed from the conversation of, okay, who's responsible, who must act. Um, and it's, again, it's just something I think that we should put on folks' radar is, is that, yes, there's going to be multiple state agencies, federal entities, local entities involved in, in ADV cleanups. They are now, they will in the future, especially as, as, as this work group gains steam and starts to put some things into um, into effect. But there are also responsible parties. And in some cases, they need to continue to be part of the conversation as we figure out how do we really get ahead of this. You can go to the next slide, Kate. Um, Kate, were you going to say something here? Or can we just go? Yeah, perfect. No, just that we're transitioning from um... We're going to be transitioning from having named what we can do, what we should, like, what we can currently do within authorities, some gaps we've already identified, and we're going to shift gears here to talk about some of um, the recommendations on how to address those challenges. And you're going to share a little bit about that before we awesome. move on Thank to discussion. You. So that's all. So yeah, no, okay, perfect. I didn't know if you had a, a little bit of transition there or not, but that was you did it adequately. That was or amazingly. That was perfect. So in 2018, um, there was a comprehensive work group of parties from Western states, some state officials, some private individuals, um, uh, a facilitating group that developed a document that detailed the challenges faced by the Western states on ADVs. Um, that document, the, the white paper referenced on the screen, led to the creation of, of what is called the ADV Blue Ribbon Report for Western states, and the, the, the cover is there. Um, before I go any further, for those of you that are not either familiar with the document or actually haven't read it in, in its entirety. It's not incredibly long. It's a, it's a, <laughs> a decent half hour, a good half hour read. Um, I, you all should, because this document will probably be referenced many times, not only now, but throughout this work group. Um, so as, as, as part of it, there's a list of recommendations that should be considered and implemented for a state to have a successful ADV prevention and mitigation program. They're broken up into some different categories. You see those in the bottom of the screen right now, um, authority, prevention, outreach and education, removal, funding, um, and then some recommendations for some of the, the federal partners. Since today's focus is primary on that, primarily on the, that authority piece, I'm just gonna touch on those authority items today, but you will see in subsequent meetings we will look at the prevention ones. We will look at the public outreach and education um, ones. You know, a note before we get into those recommendations is this: the the Blue River Report is not necessarily a model act with with statute language, um, but it uses that that needs analysis in that white paper to identify those areas that must be adequately addressed. Um, these also these ideas aren't necessarily things that have been politically vetted. Um, or vetted for financial and, and legal feasibility. These are, these are areas where attention must be focused for a state. And it's not just written for Oregon, it's written for, for all the Western states um, to address. It's an excellent starting point in determining what items you know, should be addressed by this group. 
it, it kind of gives us the okay this what must is what must be done but much of the you know how that is to be done is yet to be determined and i think this group is is in a position to make some of those you know fill in those details and make some of those those uh, recommendations a reality so can you go to the next slide kate <clears throat> um so these were the seven items in that authorities section and I was going to go over these briefly as just, you know, these are things that have been identified previously of things that needs to be addressed. This might not be a comprehensive list for Oregon, but it's a starting point for us in this group to then see, okay, where do we start focusing the work on? Who needs to start doing what to, to fill in the blanks that we may have? Um, so I'll go over these briefly. The first one was to ensure broad capabilities within ADV programs. A lot of that has been touched on by Dorothy and by Chris previously. Um, there are some broad, some overlapping authorities um, in state agencies, local entities, um, even the federal entities as well, as, as you heard from the Coast Guard fo folks into where, where their nexus is. Um, most of these authorities don't, don't go beyond true ADVs, um, whether going after, the, the report calls, calls them nuisance boats. I don't love that terminology, but I'll use it here for, um, because it's, it's how the, the report talks about, you know, there are there is a, a nexus with ADVs and some of the houselessness issues in parts of the state too. And, and whether this that is trying to be addressed through here is, I guess I'm just gonna leave that open for now, but that's part of the conversation. Um, another recommendation from the Blue Ribbon Report is was to empower local authorities to remove ADVs. I would argue in many ways, some of those authority or, or some of those entities may already be empowered with the authority but that does not necessarily mean they're empowered with the actual means, with, with the money, with the expertise even, um, to make some of those things actually happen. Um, mandate adherence to due process. That's, I mean, good advice anyway. It's a good opportunity to point out that there is indeed a pretty onerous process for seizing and following through dismantling a vessel. Onerous also does not mean bad. It's that way for a reason. It's to protect certain rights. Um, but there is a, it's important for everyone to understand, there is a process in place. Um, the fourth recommendation was to empower agencies to dispose of ADVs in publicly beneficial ways. Um, there are states, this is not necessarily a challenge in Oregon as much as, um, at least in some cases in, in Washington and other states, a seized boat must be put up for auction. I can tell you our practices here at the Marine Board, we usually, if we remove a boat, that has already been in an ADV situation once, the last thing that we wanna do is put that back out into the stream of potential new ADVs. Um, so sometimes the most beneficial thing to do with a boat is to destroy it and, and, and take it out of circulation. Um, the next one has been kind of covered extensively already, making sure that agencies with removing authority can remove any vessel, commercial or recreational, um, and then, so so again, I mean, the Marine Board, it is our policy typically not to get involved in larger commercial vessels. A lot of that's just a strictly a financial restriction. And also it is, they're not our customers, but that is a policy. It's just, that's not statutory or even in, in rule or anything like that. And then these last two on here are two that would absolutely require some sort of legislative intervention, um, empowering private property owners to declare vessels abandoned or, or to seize vessels um, as abandoned. Right now, that is there's no legal pathway for that um, in current statutes. And another thing that was pointed out, the last thing, and then I'll be done, is to extend ticketing authority to state agencies um, to enforce vessel registration and, and other laws. The Marine Board doesn't have any ticketing authority whatsoever. So we rely on our law enforcement partners, many of which we contract with, um, they may, that may or may not be the best way forward. If that were to be changed, it would take a statutory change. Something that was brought up recently that we had kind of just considered, you know, what would that look like is that we cannot penalize anyone for having an ADV, even if it's a very, um, very clear and cut. The only thing that we can do is start a seizure process and, and threaten that owner with being liable for all costs incurred because of that vessel. Um, there are some instances in which maybe some more voluntary compliance could occur if there are other tools at our disposal. Again, not proposing that necessarily at this point, just saying like that's something that doesn't currently exist that, that could be an avenue going forward. 
And then the last thing is I mentioned it earlier, uh, local law enforcement may not be motivated to, to, to do a whole lot of work on, on registration compliance or, or to participate in ADV prevention work. Um, and that may be because they're not paid to do so. So trying to, to address that, change that funding stream um, could be a uh, potential opportunity to, for improvement. This is by no means a comprehensive list of all things that, that could be done in the realm of authority, but uh, the, the um, Blue Ribbon Report certainly gets us started. And I, th I think it's gonna go back to the group soon to, to see what else might be worth considering. So Kate, go ahead. Yeah, I think before um, we switch to the discussion, which we're about to do, I'm going to invite a pause, you know, we're an hour in, we have another hour to go, maybe a quick three, four minute bio break, um, just uh, before we switch gears to um, our discussion. So I'm just going to leave this slide up, but yeah, I'll see you in a few minutes. And give it one more minute for this uh, bio break and then I'll invite people to join us back again. Okie dokie. I'm going to officially start talking again. Um, <laughs> all right. We only have one more slide. I promise this, this slide uh, before um, we invite questions and discussion. Um, before we did so, we wanted to first uh, just recap some of the um, key takeaways 
Um, I, I spoke to uh, most, if nearly all of you, uh, as part of this series of stakeholder interviews. Um, and uh, the feedback that we heard uh, regarding authorities and jurisdiction was a little bit more general. Um, I definitely uh, got a lot of details around disposal reporting and things like that. But with regards to our authorities and jurisdiction, it was it was kind of simple. The stakeholders want the processes for vessel reporting, seizure, disposal to be less confusing um, and are seeking more structure guidance and support um, at the state level for a coordinated kind of statewide effort. Um, I also heard that the problems and the negative impacts are ADVs, of ADVs are growing each year exponentially. It's, it's not like a year to year, we kind of have the same problem. It's, it, we've had, we've, that, that um, agencies as well as many of the stakeholders um, I spoke to have kind of noted a, an uptick in um, the problem. Um, and that there is a need to act now with the authorities that uh, that do exist currently. Um, and that in general, um, folks felt that many of the authorities needed to address, if not prevent the ADVs, um, are there, but what's missing is, is not so much the authorities, but the funding, streamlined procurement, and safe disposal options. So um, that there are barriers to, um, to basically you know, using those authorities. Um, and then lastly, that there are opportunities for new or revised authorities to increase the prevention piece. Um, so with that, I am going to invite our facilitator, Eric Jensen, um, to kind of take over the reins on um, this next phase. Um, let's see if we're good. Oh, there you are. I see you. All right. Are you ready? Yeah, yeah, right. yeah. We want to right, right. Go ahead. <laughs> so um, a lot of information has been shared and covered today. And before we get into the question that you see on in on the screen, um, what I'd like to do is just to uh, invite you to ask any clarification questions um, that you have on what's been presented. And then after that, we'll move in, into a discussion. But uh, just thought some of you may have some questions based on what's been presented. Um, so open up the floor for that. Remember to, to raise your hands if you would. I saw one get raised and then went away. Oh, there we go, Mike. Did you have a question? Yes, trying to get my camera to work. <laughs> there we go. Uh, Mike Dunning, Port of Coos Bay. Um, at the beginning of the conversation, I think it was Chris with DSL made a comment about DSL ownership. I was under the assumption of what he said earlier, but there are quite a few areas in Coos Bay that, it, that the submerged land does have private ownership um, below the ordinary high water mark. And I learned that through dealing with a derelict vessel with DSL. So the state doesn't necessarily own all that's, waters. Thank you. Actually, I'm glad you brought that up, uh, Mike. That's um, I mentioned there's waterways that haven't been determined to be navigable. They're actually, yeah, like the port of um, Gold Beach, the port of Brookings, both have uh, facilities that are dredged backwards from upland. And those are also in private ownership. So those would not be state-owned submer submersible lands. Um, it's something that we would address uh, as that. So that was, that was another good point is of lands that uh, um, might actually be along a navigable waterway, but are not um, part of that state-owned submersible land. So thank you. Thanks. Th thanks, Chris, for the response. Um, Mark? Yeah, I was, I was just going to say, I believe the port of Alsea's Bay, as well as the port of Garibaldi's Bay are not state owned, if I recall correctly, as well. Isn't that right, Chris? Garibaldi, for sure, because um, I remember they had a vessel that sank that we couldn't help, didn't help them with, or they, uh, couldn't help them with. And um, I'd have to look at Alsea. Great, thanks. Uh, howdy. Uh, I don't think we're hearing you. 
it, it doesn't show you being muted, but. Hmm. Um, May we come back? There we go. Yeah. Okay. So, try again. No. Uh, I'm losing. Kate. How about this? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Sorry about that. I have multiple microphones. Um, the question I have for Chris is a follow up question. Uh, the Columbia River uh, is navigable, but the portion of the state acquired at statehood was I mean, substantially altered by the dams, uh, Bonneville, the Dalles, and uh, John Day and McNary. Uh, what is the state's, is, does the state own pretty much all the, the lands under the water now, or is it is it a I, private ownership? I, 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 there's another one. Yeah, I think, so the river's um, navigable um, and declared navigable, but no, I believe the pools behind those rivers, the, the ownership is more slender than the way, the, than the size of the river today. So, and I think that actually might impact some of those other up, up river ports too. So there's direct, there's another spot where I think, um, the full pool width is not state owned uh, for title purposes. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. And uh, I assume you're you're still stretching your hand. Uh, you're not raising your hand again. Is that correct? <laughs> just just check it. Okay. Um, all right. Anybody else have a clarification question before we dive into some discussion here? Not seeing any hands. Uh, let's move on to the next slide, if we can. The drum roll. There we go. So uh, we've got just a little over a half an hour for some discussion here. And, and what we'd like to do is to uh, talk about uh, some of the gaps and barriers that you folks to authorities and jurisdiction that you see at the state level. Uh, we'll also uh, talk a little bit about local, but first we'll talk about the state level. Uh, and then I'd like to circle back uh, to some of the recommendations that came out of the Blue Ribbon uh, Program Report and uh, see if you have any uh, comments about those. But uh, first of all, let's uh, just start with this discussion. And you know, what do you see as the gaps or barriers to authorities and jurisdiction at the state level? And um, if you could uh, uh, be succinct, but substantive in your, uh, in your thoughts. And they could be that you're also just validating some, th some things that you already heard today. Let's see any hands? Uh, yes, uh, William. So really what it gets down to for me is that here in Rainier, we deal with this frequently, right? This idea of abandoned vessels, derelict vessels. And believe it or not, um, I can't think of a single instance in which one of these was properly licensed, registered, or anything of the sort, right? So if you're to treat it the same way that you treat a car, you know, how would you treat a vehicle that's out here that's not like you know we had one show up the other day that hasn't had a licensed owner in like 30 years right so it it should be easier to track all of these things to me that goes a long way towards kind of the accountability piece holding the owner responsible well who's the owner gee well i don't know according to the records this guy over here owned it 30 years ago that does me no good at all yeah okay very good, good, good point. Uh, and then uh, Rachel. Hi everyone. Um, so I actually think one of the biggest gaps and barriers that um, I foresee this um, program having is going to be the state legislature itself and um, obtaining ongoing adequate funding for the problem and getting them to understand the ongoing 
ongoing issue that this is and that won't be solved overnight and how um, historically, as just previously mentioned, boats can be derelict after 30 or 40 years. And it's really hard to track down that owner of the most recent time period. So being able to backtrack that um, would be really important, but it's not going to be an issue that's solved overnight. So I think really making a case to the legislature to ensure that funding is continued and that this isn't just the one time three year program um, for, I think it was 18 million that was funded for it, but something ongoing, I see that as a potential barrier, but I also see it as a really big opportunity to ensure that this program can get ahead of it. So that's just something I see. Great. Thank you, Rachel. So uh, state funding, being able to maintain state funding and and getting that from the state legislature is uh, uh, definitely a, a gap or challenge. Um, all right. Uh, Aaron, I think you're next. OK, can you hear me all right? Yes. I think uh, one of the one of the main barriers is like just, you know, somebody was using the analogy of vehicles previously. Um, it's the lack of recourse for a lot of this stuff. So if you have somebody in the marina who, or wherever you're at, you got somebody at your moorings who has abandoned a vessel, you declare it abandoned, then what do you do with it? Um, getting it out of the water, uh, depending on the size and type of vessel, is a lot of times uh, prohibitive, or uh, kicking them out of your moorings and sending them somewhere else for a lot of estuaries uh, in on the coast, especially there's not really where are they going to go to. They're not going to go anywhere else. Um, so lack ability, lack of the ability to impound things would be, you know, like to, to actually take possession of it and put it someplace where you have it and uh, someone else doesn't have access to it is, is a little bit more difficult when you're talking about boats that are moored on docks as opposed to vehicles that are just, you know, alongside the street. Right. So uh, the ability to be able to take possession and, and but Aaron, are you are you talking about this uh, uh, in terms of uh, at the state level uh, or are you uh, is it a broader comment than that? No, uh, not necessarily at the state level. I'm talking about uh, those of us who are trying to prevent vessels from going abandoned or um, to get ourselves aligned properly so that we can take action if they do get abandoned. Mm -hmm. Okay. Great, thanks. All right, I think uh, Mike, you're next. So kind of in line with what Aaron was saying, um, but I do think it's an issue at the state level. With some of the vessels we've dealt with in Coos Bay, you know, there's there's an issue of, we have the authority to do X, but the, and we may get to this, I may be jumping ahead, but the, the powers of that authority are the problem. Um, you know, it's, we're, we're going to, we're going to give you a civil penalty. We're going to write you a fine. We're going to send you another letter. And still the conquistador sits there today, uh, three plus years, I think now later, um, sitting on state land, state piles, and it hasn't moved. Nobody's done anything. Um, and, and it's unfortunate to watch. And I think that's because the SL has authority. They have jurisdiction, but they're handcuffed. There's only so many things they can do. So I think that's that's got to change before we can improve this process. So being able to, to give the state uh, uh, agencies more authority or more teeth, if you will, to be able to do enforcement. Uh, 100%. Like, like I've heard civil penalties. Civil penalties aren't going to do anything for the individuals. The type of people that are abandoning these boats and leaving them uh, it's, it's going to do nothing. Um, and I'm, I'm looking at ORS 164 decimal 805 offensive littering. I mean, that's a, that's a classy misdemeanor for offensive littering, but you can dump a boat full of fuel and PCPs and let it sit in the water for 10 years. And we only want to give you a civil penalty. It, it doesn't make sense to me. Yeah. Okay, great. Thanks. Um, Aaron, uh, your hand is still on. I don't know if you're stretching or you have another comment. No, I, I just wanted to, because what Mike was talking about there kind of, you know, racked my memory a little bit. What I, what I was getting at was the practicality, just like Mike was saying, the state and those of us who run these facilities are all in the same situation. When you look at the various um, 
estuaries, there's only so many resources that are available. And it's not like there's towing services in abundance. It's not like there's boat haul out facilities in abundance everywhere. What I'm getting at is, uh, as a matter of practicality, whether it's us or the state who's going to take control and do something about it uh, directly, it's um, there's n the resources don't exist that need to be in place for somebody to be able to accept a boat and do something with it. That's what I'm getting at. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, being able to have have the resources available to, to actually act on it is it's important. All right. Um, looking for more hands. Any other hands with regard? Again, we're talking about uh, gaps at the state level. Uh, Mark. Well, um, one of the things that has always perplexed me about it is that if you're an authority that's willing to take action, oftentimes uh, with a abandoned or derelict vessel, um, if you uh, take that action, you also oftentimes get stuck with the liability, with the cost, and so forth. I mean, I can uh, tell you with a lot of certainty, and I'm sure Aaron and Mike and others can uh, back me on this, is that if you take proactive uh, recourse and seize and dispose of a boat, oftentimes it's the uh, port who will end up having to pay the freight and it's the port taxpayers and uh, customers who are really ending up having to pay for somebody else's trash. And so that's one of the, I think one of the larger challenges here is if you're trying to be proactive you often are penalized for doing so because, again, th there are a variety of reasons, uh, lack of funds, et cetera. But it seems like it's almost um, you get penalized for trying to do the right thing is what I'm saying. The, the other thing I'm, I'm hearing from you, Mark, uh, in your comment is uh, given some of the, the gaps or barriers at, at, at the state level, it does have a trickle down effect at the local level. Um, in yeah, I, local I mean, I can, I can mention, you know, and, and Aaron and Mike know this well. I mean, Garibaldi had an instance where they had a vessel that sank in their marina. It was about 60 footer. It cost them a quarter million dollars to get it out of the, the marina. They didn't have that budgeted in to their you know annual budget and and so that what happens is that money gets spent to remove that vessel get it stored get it um you know properly disposed of when they could have used that money for example to improve their uh their infrastructure at the port and and so those are the kind of things that you know, Mike and Aaron can agree with me or not, but I, I, I those are the kind of challenges, for example, our, our ports are facing whereby their limited and precious resources are being um, um, redirected to respond to this, uh, to these problems. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Uh, any other uh, comments about state level? Uh, Chris? Oh, I, there's two Chris's up there. I, that's right. I've already talked a lot. So let me uh, let Mr. Hathaway go first. And All I'll, right, Chris I'll Hathaway. Sure. Thanks, Chris. Um, and Eric. Um, yeah, I mean, I think the thing that comes to mind for me is like we had presentations from four different agencies, right, with overlapping authorities and semi-authorities and um, clean water and registration for boats. But what what there isn't is one agency with staff to develop a plan and to track their vessels in a database and to have consistent funding and to coordinate cleanups and to work with stakeholders and partners like the ports. Um, does sometimes seem like one powerfully authorized agency with staff and funding could cut through a lot of the um, challenges associated with this. Great. And, and, you know, what I just heard you say is really, if, if there's an opportunity to really have one state agency that is 
uh, that that has the responsibility of being having the being the clearinghouse and be, and being the uh, the leader on the mitigation front uh, on this, it, it would make it it would make it easier to have that kind of centralization at the state level. Is that correct? Yeah, and it wouldn't even need to be just on the mitigation front. It could also be on the being proactive front, um, and kind of up and down the line, so to speak. And well said. Thank you. All right. Uh, other Chris? <laughs> yeah, thank you for that. Thank you, Chris. Thanks, Eric. Um, just one other thing I wanted to note as um, it, it's maybe, I don't know if it's a gap, but something to be aware of for the other folks on this call that can be an enforcement agency under the Marine Board statute. And uh, it's, it, um, when you are, there is a, a due process with regards to, there's the seizure process and then the right to a hearing should somebody um, not uh, come up and, and want to halt the seizure process. Um, I actually think the first step, the hearing process under the Marine Board statutes is pretty streamlined. It allows for a hearing and the agency can hold that. It doesn't have to be a contested case hearing. Um, from the department stamp uh, perspective or, or our uh, experience, it can still be, ex you know, it takes staff time, it's sort of a fixed cost, but it means your staff's not doing other things. They've got to prep for a hearing, et cetera. Uh, and then for us though, we are represented by counsel through the Department of Justice. It's general counsel at the hearing phase. Um, so it's not terribly expensive, but it is something still that you, you'd want to think about if, if you're an enforcement agency. And then for us, if they take a next step that they do want real judicial review, it goes to circuit court in the county that it, uh, and this has happened to us, uh, circuit court in the county where the action's occurring. And then you are getting, for your legal fees, you are getting more expensive for DSL um, through DOJ. That means you got a trial attorney and your general counsel probably all day uh, hearing in, in a circuit court in front of a judge. Uh, so it's just something to be aware of with, with regards to costs, besides just the cost of seizing the vessel and then taking that step to, to remove it. Thanks. Great. Thank you, Chris. Appreciate the clarification. Uh, other comments? All right. Um, let's move on and let's uh, focus this down to the, the local level if we can um, and talk about gaps and barriers to authority and jurisdiction at the local level. Uh, does anybody have any comments about that? And uh, By the way, at, at this point in time, we're, we're uh, having work group members uh, participate in this and then there'll be an opportunity at, at uh, 245 uh, for other people who are attending to be able to share some thoughts. All right, um, anybody have uh, anything at the local level that you want to comment on? It all came out in the, la in the last round, huh? Oh, yes, uh, Mike D. I'll talk again. So um, as we go through the abandoned process, and I can't remember the statute number that allows us to seize the vessel, do the 30-day notification, uh, I think you were just describing that, but statute describes it, I believe, as a small vessel. And I've yet to find what they define as a small vessel. What length, what size, what weight? Does anybody on the call know what that is? Anybody want to respond to that? Not. I would say <laughs> maybe Chris, four feet Chris? or Josh. I think that's, uh, I think, the, the seizure process is under 830. So I don't know if it says anything about small vessel. I see an enforcement agency may seize a vessel as abandoned. But Dorothy or um, Josh, do you know, do you have any thoughts on, on the seizure process in 830? I am fairly certain there's no reference to small vessel whatsoever. Um, I'm not going to say that 110% because I need to at least do some, some quick searches, but um, we've never, I mean, the, the chapter itself is called small watercraft. Yeah. And that's, that's where I'm, that's where I'm coming from. Cause we, we use the same thing here at the port to deal with our vessels and you're saying, what's a small watercraft. There is absolutely, I mean, the word small is used a dozen times in that chapter, none of which have any applicability to <laughs> ADVs. So I would 
our agency has never felt like that there was any kind of size restriction whatsoever. Yeah, and and where I've been concerned is okay, we're 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 seizing a ninety foot commercial fishing boat. Does that become a problem? Does somebody make the argument that that's not a small vessel? Absolutely, absolutely not. Um, I if 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 our agency had the the funding and um, I guess capabilities to do some sort of removal on on that boat, I, I would have no concerns. And then likewise, I would actually look to to Chris. I mean like the, the Tiffany that we talked about in the very beginning of this conversation, that's, that's also a large boat. And I know that that was seized under the same statute. So I don't see any size limitation on the current authorities for either the state or the local level. Well, that's good news. Yep. And that is correct. We, we did the seizure process prior and seized it in place through, through the pre-seizure process um, for the Tiffany. Yeah. Some good clarification there. Uh, um, okay, uh, Doug, I believe you are next, sir. Uh, yeah, I know my organization, we have a lot of people that talk with us and uh, law enforcement agencies. And one of the things they struggle with is they have to put a, a notice on that boat that says we're gonna take it in 30 days. Well, they don't wanna put it on because they don't know that they have a place to take it in 30 days. And then if they don't do it, now all of a sudden, now they've got this, paperwork trail they have to go back through. And so I think having that process that, hey, in the end of 30 days, we know where it's going, it's going here. It, it will really help to enforce that and to cause more uh, impetus for these guys to get out there and say, hey, let's mark another one because they're disappearing now. Uh, it, it, very important to have the place to put these vessels. Yeah. All right, uh, thank you, Doug. Um, so, you know, our topic is uh, gaps at the local level, and um, we may have exhausted this and, and we'll move on. But before I do, uh, Troy, did you have a comment on that or something else? So I had a comment about, uh, on a couple of things, actually. Um, first, I didn't hear a definition for vessel anywhere in there. so. Is a vessel a paddleboard or canoe or fishing vessel? We don't know. Um, the other thing is, I didn't hear anything about how recreational vessels are applied to prior commercial or government vessels that are sold into private hands. That do they become recreational vessels at that point, um, or are you going off of as built? So, I mean, those are some of the things that I was thinking about. Uh, as far as the local level you're setting up a program for the whole state you're going to have priorities right on um, which vessels are going to be removed first for the whole state but do locals get to remove vessels that are priorities for them in their jurisdictions and then seek reimbursement through the program those um so local priorities i would say is a gap when you're comparing it to the overall state Thank and you. so uh, Troy, uh, your your point is in in part uh, related to um, definitive authority um, between the state and the local, correct? I think it's going to be shared authority mm -hmm. um, because the locals are going to have jurisdiction where the state doesn't have jurisdiction. So, but it's going to affect the same waters of the state, right? So, and they have, like a port district has their own jurisdiction. They have vessels within their port district that might be a priority for them, but it's not a high priority for the state. And mm -hmm. so it's going to sit there a little bit longer. And so if you address the local uh, authorities in your priority scheme, allow them to remove those vessels and then maybe seek reimbursement through your program or something like that, um, that would not only expand your team for removing vessels, but it would get them out quicker as well. But then that goes back to how much resources do you have? Great, great. Thank you for the clarification. And can I, can I, may I address a couple of those things, Eric, if you don't mind? Um, Cause oh, yeah. Troy makes one good point. And then there was a couple of questions in there and it actually segues into another point that I wanted to make regarding commercial and recreational anyway. The first one, Troy, you were asking about vessel. The definitions here, uh, Basically, we, I have the Coast Guard definition and also say that a dock is not a vessel. So 
paddle boards, non-motorized, those are all vessels in, in the state of Oregon for all of our laws, and that would include um, for ADV type things. Also includes floating homes. Um, it actually does include floating homes as well. That's a good. That is a good point. Um, although we have not been in the business of removing those, at least at this agency. Um, uh, as far as the, you make the great point about boats built for commercial purposes that are then sold recreationally. Um, I always I, I try to encourage people. A commercial boat, at least in Oregon law, is not necessarily a, a, a thing. It's not that boat cannot always be described as commercial. Commercial is an activity. Um, as soon as it no longer has commercial credentials, that boat now must be registered as a recreational vessel. Um, so it's it's. I think that's something that needs to be clarified. I, I think we all need to make sure that we understand that um, a boat is commercial so long as it's operating co commercially. Um, and after that, cannot just sit there unregistered. Then it, it must be credentialed by someone. Um, and then what was the, the oh, your third point um, regarding local authorities. I you're correct the structure is in place for for those those ports to to act as enforcement entities there is a, a reimbursal mechanism for that it is for that very small amount of money that we referenced earlier um i think you bring up a good point regarding the prioritization though of of what makes the state prioritize those local projects because the locals have identified it as a as a um, as a need, I know that one of these future work groups group meetings is about prioritization, and I think that's going to be kind of a really important one. We might get into some of the database stuff, stuff too at that point, um, because there is currently, I think, a lack of agreement on what the state's priorities are uh, in the in the field of ADVs. And regardless of the amount of money available, that's going to continue. So, just some 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 thoughts. Great, thank you, Josh. And um, I'd like to uh, at this point unless I see hands jumping up, move on uh, to the uh, next slide, I believe. Oh, we I forgot, that's right. We're gonna talk about the feds, um, the federal level. So uh, is there, do you see gaps or barriers to authority and jurisdiction at the federal level? Does anybody wanna comment on that? Looks like, we're not getting any takers here. Ah, Troy. So uh, again, the gap would be if the Coast Guard was to go out there to a sinking vessel, remove the fuel and oil off of the vessel, then what they do with it, they let it sink. They don't have any other options because they don't have any funding or manpower to deal with those vessels at that time. So how is the state going to step in and deal with that vessel? I think you, need, you might need to look at that because it might not meet the definition of abandoned or derelict at the time um, because it, it's going to be sitting on the surface under a, a contractor's supervision. But as soon as the Coast Guard's done, then more than likely uh, it'll be sunk again, unfortunately. Yeah. So how can the program pick up those vessels from the, the Coast Guard? Okay. Well, I think we've got somebody who's going to respond to that, uh, Lieutenant. Yes, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay. Um, I don't quite have an answer for Troy on that. That is, again, that's, as, as we were talking about authority and jurisdiction, one of the, I guess, the benefits of being a federal agency is we do have access to quite a lot of funding in order to respond to vessels that are a substantial threat to the environment of pollution discharge, but specifically related to ADVs, we have no authority. Um, that there is nothing in the Code of Federal Regulation that allows us to mitigate just an abandoned boat or a derelict boat. It's only if it it's only if it poses a threat to the environment of a discharge of oil or hazardous materials that we can then respond to it. You're also right that often, depending on how quickly we can respond to an incident, the vessel has already is either in the process of sinking or has already sunk. And it's only when it makes the most sense and it's the most cost effective for us to raise that vessel to remove the pollution that we try to partner with the state agencies in order to pass over the responsibility once we've raised it you through the contractor and we've used the oil spill liability trust fund to raise it and to remove the pollution 
that that handoff has to happen right then and there that we've removed the pollution there's no longer substantial threat our funding and our authority and our jurisdiction ends and then we can pass the responsibility of disposal of the vessel to a state agency that has that authority because it is explicitly written in the CFRs that we are not authorized to destroy vessels. Um, thank, thank you, Lieutenant. Um, it's helpful clarification. And um, we have uh, about eight minutes before we need uh, to do a hard stop for some uh, community input, um, public input. Uh, but I'd like to just turn briefly to uh, recommendations. And some of you have offered up uh, a, a few things, but if you uh, recall the recommendations uh, that I believe Josh uh, presented uh, that came out of the Blue Ribbon uh, Program Report, uh, you have one through seven up there. And then there may be other uh, recommendations as well that some of you folks might have. So what I'd like to open up the discussion to is, are any of these that are on one through seven uh, ones that you think are viable and, and should be uh, should gain a little more traction? Um, and Or is there something that's not on this list that you would like to put on the table as a recommendation? Uh, Aaron. Two things that I wanted to just uh, raise on this. One of them is on the on the ticketing there you know that this study and there's been a lot of discussion about it today uh focused on the the correlation between um lack of uh, current registrations and boats going abandoned or derelict um i think it's important to remember that correlation doesn't equal causation and i can speak from experience in our marina we have we have done several rounds of getting people up to date on our registrations and what 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 has resulted in in some in many cases is that you get a boat that's in the exact same condition that it was with a current registration. So while that might make it easier to run down somebody who's associated with uh, being responsible for it, it may not be that it may not be as effective as we hope in preventing um, the problem. And then on the other side of it, um, a recommendation that I would that I would make is that there is. Um, so we we're focusing a lot on authority and jurisdiction. We're focusing a lot on the on the um, uh, public cap or the 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 the, the government's um, hand in all of this. Um, if there is a way for the government to particularly focus funding on economic development in the maritime industry, so that some of this stuff can be privatized more effectively, um, I think that in the long run it'll, it'll help us deal with this more effectively. Because as I was saying. One of the reasons why people don't do anything with this, just like the gentleman from the yacht club was saying, uh, enforcement agencies don't like to put out put out a notice that says we're going to seize your boat in 30 days. And we're going to take it someplace when they don't have anywhere to take it to. And part of the problem with that is there's not enough boat yards that are capable of handling it. There's not enough uh, salvage. Uh, when I say salvage, what I mean is towing services, um, uh, sea tow, vessel assist, things like that are not common on the Oregon coast and many of the places here in Oregon. So it's not like you just dial somebody up and say, hey, tow this boat up to a certain boat yard for me on a certain date, because those capabilities don't just sit around. You have to have somebody mobilized to come into the region to do a small job like that. And that's one of the big gaps that we have in the maritime industry here to be able to respond to this kind of stuff in a proactive fashion. So uh, my recommendation would be to focus some work on the uh, bolstering of the industry uh, to help us out. Great. Thank you. Sorry, Eric, I muted you by accident by trying to unmute myself. So I apologize. Oh, okay. <laughs> I um, wanted to just provide a quick response to that um, uh, before um, just that um, we will be definitely talking about other types of barriers such as um, contracting, procurement, disposal, ADV, reporting, database, um, education, outreach. Um, there's there's quite a few. So I just want to acknowledge uh, that, yes, a lot of the what I mentioned earlier, sort of, we have a lot of the times we have the authorities, but there's other barriers, such as what you just described. Um, so not to say you can't mention it here, but just that we will be dedicating um, other uh, future meetings to specific topics to address more in detail, like why don't we have disposal options? Why don't we have, like, what can we do about contracting procurement? So a yes and, but. 
Thank you, Kate. All right, uh, just a few minutes left. Uh, Mike, you were next. Yeah, Mike Dunning from the Port of Bay again. Um, I, I don't think we have an issue with authorities. I, I don't think that's a problem or jurisdiction. So I, I think th this is an easy nugget for this team. Um, it, it's follow through that we have an issue with. So, and we'll get to that later, but that's from my perspective. Great, thank you. Chris Hathaway. Yeah, I think one thing that was interesting in the last, first call was learning about Metro's incentive program to help people dispose of boats before they actually become derelict. And it seems like more of that could be considered as a recommendation to think about. Great, thank you. Uh, I thought I had seen another hand up, but maybe not. Not looking like it. All right, just want to make sure. Okay, it was, it was, I'm sorry. It was me. I was. It, it wasn't more about uh, uh, authorities. Rather, it was more about prevention. And so, when we get to that topic area, I suppose I can chime up. I, my point was going to be there aren't. There only um, there really aren't any consequences for the people who abandon um, or um, have derelict vessels. So at at some point when we have that discussion, I'll chime up. Thank you, Eric. Great, thank you, Mark. All right, um, not seeing any other hands. I think we can uh, we can transition now uh, to the community input. Uh, piece. And um, so for anybody who's not on the work group that would like to share some comments, um, just uh, put your hand up and we'll call on you. I, asking that you uh, limit your remarks to two minutes. And um, do we have any takers? Wow. Okay. I I was expecting to see at least six hands go up. Right? So, uh, all right then. Um, seeing none, uh, I think we can we can move forward. And I think it's time for me to pass the baton back to Kate. Right? Yes. Thank you. Um, and uh, as a uh, you know, Eric, our our lovely facilitator, he'll be taking on a kind of more you'll. I'll be talking less, Eric will be talking more in future meetings. Um, uh, but uh, yeah, the next uh, steps um, is just that our next meeting is on October 24th. Um, and again, they are on Tuesdays. Um, we'll be sharing, uh, I'll be sending out a notice, an email to all of you uh, one week from uh, today, um, sharing an update on uh, the anticipated agenda. Um, you know, we kind of wanted to first have this conversation, uh, you know, to kind of get a sense of some of the priorities um, uh, of the members here and the areas of concern uh, to inform how we were going to uh, create those agendas and structure these conversations. So, um, yeah, we will be uh, we'll be sharing an update in a week and we'll see you in two weeks. Um, and I'll also follow up via email after we hang up today um, with a link to that. ADV uh, Blue Ribbon Program Report. Uh, again, that was a 2018 effort that several, um, uh, actually several uh, of the agencies on the call today were a member of. Uh, actually, Troy, <laughs> I think, was one of the authors of that report. Um, so I'll share that resource. I just think it's uh, helpful, um, as, as Josh um, shared, as sort of a grounding of, like, if you had all the money in the world... <laughs> You know what would be an ideal model program, um, and so now we our job is to look at it and find out, um, and, and combine with your input and solutions, um, what makes the most sense for Oregon for the first uh, couple of years of this program. Um, with that, I don't have anything else to add except see you all soon. Yeah. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. Yeah. Right. Bye.